Hello and welcome to London Guided Walks podcast. In the coming episodes, we will be sharing our love and passion for London, its people, places and history in an espresso shot with a splash of personality. For those of you who don't know me, I am Hazel Baker, founder of londonguidedwalks.co.uk, providing guided walks, private tours and treasure hunts to Londoners and visitors alike, and now bringing you a jam-packed podcast during the time of the coronavirus. The 23rd of April is not only Shakespeare's birthday, it is also St George's Day, St George being the patron saint of England. There are several ways for us to uncover St George in London but this year I want to talk about one of my great loves and that is the dragons of London. The dragon is a creature which above all others has haunted our imaginations throughout time. The dragon has left its mark in folklore of our ancestors. In the western world Almost all dragon stories portray the dragon as the villain from whom the hero must protect the city or indeed the princess. But some dragons can take on the form of the protector. Although the time that dragons first appeared in myths isn't known for sure, they can be traced back as far as approximately 4000 BC. Now, dragons are said to have been able to live almost anywhere, depending on the type of dragon mentioned. Their habitats range from the centre of the earth to the middle of the ocean. They could also be found in caves, fire or anywhere dark and damp. And of course, you can find hundreds of them in London. Now, as I'm sure you've heard from episode one, London as we know it would never have existed uh, were it not for the Romans. Now, the Romans um, don't have dragons that are unique to them. Their dragons are based on stories from Greek mythology and they expanded on those and changed the names to Roman names. And Roman dragons combine the serpentine Greek dragons with the dragons of the Near East to give us a dragon that is closer to what we would imagine a European dragon to be with a long body, four clawed feet and crests upon their heads. The generals of Rome often use dragons as an excuse for not completing their missions. Handy that. In the 3rd century BC, General Attilius Regulus was in North Africa, battling Carthage. At Bagrada River, a dragon attacked his army. According to the report, a dragon crept up and situated itself behind the Romans' army wall. General Regulus ordered his men to kill it, which they did, but not before it was able to kill a number of their colleagues. Many soldiers were taken by the dragon's vicious mouth and many were crushed by its tail. Its hide was too thick for their weapons to get through, so they started using siege weapons to crush it with heavy stones. They skinned the creature and sent it way back to Rome, to the Senate there. When the Senate measured the skin, it was 120 feet in length. The hide was on display in Rome for a hundred years. So when the Romans came to London... The dragons came too. During the 2nd century AD, the Roman cavalry adopted the draco as their military standard. It took the form of a large dragon on the end of a lance, with silvered gaping jaws, with the rest of the body made of coloured silk. The jaws faced the wind, so the silk body could inflate and ripple in the air. The Romans first used it during the Hippica Gnasia, their cavalry games. These games were glamorous training exercises that were performed in decorated armour. The Draco was used as a target for the opposing team to hit the score points. From these games, the Draco was adopted as a normal military standard and was used as a standard until the fall of the Empire in 476 AD. In England we associate St George with slaying the dragon and indeed dragons guard the city of London too and they mark out the different gates of the city i.e. Alders Gate, Bishop's Gate, Temple Bar, Bridge Gate and Moor Gate. 
Dragons have been used in stories to protect something as well. Think of Smorg in J.R.R. Tolkien's 1937 novel The Hobbit, who protects Erebor, albeit for himself. The City of London boundary dragons are cast iron dragon statues on metal or stone plinths. The dragons are painted silver, with details of their wings and tongue pinked out in red. The dragon stands on its two rear legs, with its right foreleg raised and the left foreleg holding a shield, which bears the City of London's coat of arms, painted in red and white. The design of these dragons are based on two large dragon sculptures which are seven feet high mounted on the entrance of the coal exchange on Lower Thames Street and they were designed by city architect J.B. Bunning and made by London founder Dewar in 1849. The dragons were preserved when the coal exchange was demolished in 1962 and the two original statues were re-erected on six feet high plinths of Portland stone at the western boundary of the city by Temple Gardens on Victoria Embankment. Some of my favourite dragons in the City of London are those on the monument. Maybe because they've been there for over 300 years and look a little bit worn. They are the work of Edward Pierce Jr., a sculptor and architect frequently employed by Sir Christopher Wren, and they cost about £50 each dragon. But where is the fifth dragon? If you look at the west-facing plaque, done by Keyes Gabriel Sibber, you will notice a dragon underneath the figure of a woman representing the city of London. He is supporting, with his paw, the shield of the city of London, and with his back, is trying to support her. You could argue, however, that this dragon looks much more like a dog. Joining me today is Hannah Hutzbar, Chief Dragon Twitcher from Dragons of London. Hello. Hello. Well, my first question is, what is a Chief Dragon Twitcher? Um, well, uh, as as the uh, founder of uh, Dragons of London, what we do is we are recording the uh, unique biodiversity of London's dragon population. So much like bird watchers, but uh, watching dragons, whether that's in uh, uh, dragons which appear to be in architecture or uh, street art or dragons in public spaces. Um, but d- despite uh, the rumours, they are real and not statues and paintings <laughs> and street signs. And dragons are so much cooler than birds anyway, aren't they? Yes, uh, I, I think personally, I am biased, but I think dragons are a lot cooler than birds. Um, and there's just a much wider variety in terms of uh, size, shape, colour. Um, yes. What was it about dragons in London that first got you interested? Um, so I've always been someone who sort of spots the interesting bits of architecture, the the twiddles, the ornamental elements. Um, and I started to realise that dragons were one of the most common, they're not the most common motif, but they're one of the most regular, notably cool things that you will spot in, uh, in architecture and design out and about in London. And what has kept you so interested in dragon twitching? Um, so there's, there's a huge variety in dragons, both in sort of what they look like. Uh, there's a lot of species variation, um, but there's also a huge variety in where they appear. So there's everything from sort of so there's heraldic type dragons turning up in lots of sort of formal and historical parts of London. But you've also got, say, a absolutely giant dragon taking up multiple floors um, outside a Camden all-you-can-eat buffet. Um, and they turn up in sort of pubs, restor- uh, a lot of Asian restaurants. There's a huge sort of variety in shapes and styles from sort of very, from sort of palaces and cathedrals right through to your local boozer or your local restaurant. And what is it about dragons that keeps you interested? So I, I really like that they appear across London in a lot of variety of places and styles. And what got you started in all of this? Um, so 
the the honest answer is uh, I have ADHD and I am wired for novelty. I always notice sort of people's jewelry or yeah the the interesting architectural decorative elements. I just I think I'm naturally a bit of a treasure hunter in some ways. I, I'm also a licensed mudlark. I, I I like looking for cool things. Um, but uh, there were one or two dragons which I noticed when I was out and about, which especially caught my eye, um, where I just found myself, which suddenly sort of attuned me to looking specifically for dragons. Um, and once I started looking, I didn't stop. You had no idea how this was going to catch on. I had no idea when I started <laughs> Dragons of London that it would become this bigger thing or that people would be able to send them in from quite so many places. And that's something I really enjoy. And there's something extra, isn't there, about the physical walking around London and enjoying the sights and seeing a few things that maybe most people will walk past a thousand times and never notice. And it also kind of gamifies walking around town. Yes, Or I absolutely. sometimes realise that, oh, I'm near Colney Hatch Lane. I heard someone say that there was something really cool on a roof around here. I'll have a little look. So that means essentially that you're experiencing London in a way that most people uh, don't even consider. It both opens up London in a different way and also it kind of encourages me to see more of it as well, to wander around more different places, just in case, because you never know what you'll see. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we first connected over Instagram, wasn't it, about a year ago now when I was doing my dragon talk for the Mayor of London's St George's celebrations in Trafalgar Square. And it was just about the same time as you were actually setting up um, your Instagram account as well. And you've got a really active following, haven't you? I mean, these are people are really dedicated of sharing their love and enthusiasm for these exquisite animals. Yes, um, I. the first few tip-offs were from people I knew who I'd sort of who'd spotted me doing this new project on social media. But yeah, I have been delighted by how far afield things come in. And there's one or two people who've become very regular, <laughs> who who are some of our star dragon twitchers, who who also have started really looking out for it. Um, but yeah, we get them sent in from everywhere from uh, street art to these days with the uh, lockdown, there's there's more much more coming in from sort of suburban locations, often uh, nesting on the on the very top of a roof, looking a lot like an architectural finial, but it's not. It's a real dragon, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and and people are sending them from far and wide, aren't they? There's dragons everywhere. Yeah, they've been coming in from far and wide at this point, and we've also had lots of people sending them in from other parts of the world which is lovely but we are we do have a geographical remit um mostly just so that you can actually if you are in london you should be able to go see all of them uh uh, quarantine restrictions notwithstanding but uh, i like the idea that everything is visible within sort of the range of an oyster card it is a tremendous amount of fun. I've spent many a happier hour walking around the streets of London, uh, mostly looking up and walking into a few uh, lampposts along the way. Now, if anybody else wants to get involved, how do they do that? Uh, so people can get involved by uh, if they see if you see a dragon, snap a dragon uh, is our slogan. So if if you see a dragon out in the wild, um, by which I mean not pets um if, if you have uh, lovely figurines or toys that's great but we're, we're focused on ones in the public domain um and yeah if you see a dragon uh take a photo and send it in uh let us know where you spotted it as well because we really like being able to say these are all the green ones or these are all the ones in richmond or and so that you can sort of categorize them and have a look on our website um if people aren't able to get a good photo, but they do know where there is a, where dragons are, we are also delighted to get tip-offs. And what about this time with lockdown? Are you being able to uh, see enough dragons to uh, uh, feed your habit? And is technology your friend? We started using Google Street View a bit to sort of patch in where we can't go visit them ourselves. But um, I've got a camera with a scarily good zoom lens. So even if you can only get a blurry snap on your phone, um, send it in and you know when I'm allowed out again uh, I will I will see if I can get a high res photo of it um, so if people want to get in touch with us on our social media channels which is at Dragons of London on Instagram and Twitter and uh, on Facebook our page is Dragons of London also the email address is dragontwitchers at gmail.com 
all one word, and uh, our website is dragonsoflondon.org. And for not, I'll add all of these into the show notes, um, just in case you're driving somewhere and want to take note of that. So Hannah, you mentioned there is a wide variety of dragons to be seen, but where can people see uh, dragons in London? Is it really that simple of just opening your eyes and looking around? Almost. Uh, good question. Um, there are a lot of dragons about if you start looking for them. Um, if you're actually in the city of London, then there are uh, usually there's a lot of uh, grey dragons with a little, little red flash on their wings, the red-tipped Londiniums, um, and they are about uh, on almost every... They nest on almost every street sign and bollard. Um, but there's also... Uh, some of the most famous dragons in London are the boundary dragons. There are uh, dragons that are about two foot tall or so, um, marking the boundaries in, in and out of the city of London, dotted around central London, sort of on that perimeter. Um, on the tops of uh, church spires sometimes, um, but also things like plasterwork in sort of fancy old-fashioned pubs. Now, hopefully most Londoners will be able to point out a boundary dragon if they had seen one. Um, but how did it all start? Where have they come from? Um, they descend uh, from an original breeding pair that were on the London Coal Exchange, which was a big ornate Victorian building. Uh, and that was demolished, I think, in the 60s. It was on what is now Lower Thames Street. Um, and those that, that original pair, they, they fled the nest and uh, perched on the boundary of uh, Victoria Embankment. Um, but then they, they have a, a number of their children are now dotted around guarding central London. Yes, and these must be the uh, the red-tipped Londoniums you were mentioning before. And thanks, Hannah, for sharing your dragon-twitching love with us. And for anybody who wants to get started on looking for these magnificent beasts themselves, then get my free Top 10 Dragons in the City of London guide on londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash dragon download. And don't forget to tag Hannah at Dragons of London on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook for those that you find. And for those of you who want to look at more detail of the dragons in London and know the history there, we do provide a private dragon tour and all details are available on our website. That's all from us for now. Don't forget to visit londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast for more detailed show notes, including photos, blog posts and recommended reading. (laughs) 